Reinenberg from the Icon School of Medicine is here to talk to you about Mythical Beasts. So raise your hand if you've been seen on the Science Channel, the show Mythical Beasts. Have you been watching it? Sweet. So uh, she's going to talk about that and she's going to debunk some of these myths that we have about each of our critters that are out there, like the Loch Ness Monster and many others. So Dr. Joy Reinenberg, she not only is a mythical beast, but also a show called Inside Nature's Giants. So if you want to see some really cool anatomy where she dissects things like sperm whales or hippos, and then she compares that with other species, it's a really great series. So without further ado, let's give her a great big West Texas ECISD welcome, Dr. Joy Reinenberg. Okay, so inside the rattlesnake's mouth, 
house, and I'm terrified to actually show this to you because I don't want to get bitten because there's still venom in this head. But inside this mouth, on the upper part right here, are fangs that hang down from the upper jaw. And these fangs that hang down from the upper jaw, there's one right over here, and there's another one right here. These, can you see them? Maybe you can see them in there. They're tucked in to the jaw. You have to pull them out. I don't have a tweezer to pull them out, but they're sitting right up in here, inside that mouth. Let's turn around to the lamp. There's a lamp here. There. So if you look into that mouth, tucked into the upper part of the mouth are fangs. And when these fangs come out and they bite into your skin, they pump in venom. And if you don't get into venom, you could die from this. So this was a terrifying animal. It was kind of like representing heaven and hell all at once. You've got this bird that can go to heaven, and then you've got this snake that can take you to hell. And the other interesting thing about the snake is that snakes actually shed their skin. So this is this is not a shed skin. This one looks like it was taken off of the animal as they, they cleaned the animal. Let me dial this out the other way. We're zooming out. There you go. Okay. So when a snake sheds its skin, it sheds its skin. Sorry, say that three times fast. When a snake sheds its skin, it looks like the ghost of the snake. And so they thought that this was an animal that was immortal. It could go between the world of the living and the spirit world, because it could shed its skin and start anew as if it was reborn. How many have ever seen a shed skin from a snake? It looks ghostly. It even has colors over the eye. It's really interesting, because the eye is actually covered by a clear scale. So it gets shed. The outer part of the eye gets shed. Why is it that snakes don't have to blink? Because their eyes actually cover. It's got a windshield over its eye. So it doesn't need to blink. The moisture is on the other side. It's like it's got permanent contact lines over its eyes. Okay, so that's our feathered serpent mythology. What's interesting about this particular myth is we're talking about an animal that was really made up from the two very respected animals that lived in the area. A bird and a snake to make a feathered serpent. Let's talk about another animal that's a little bit serpent-like, and that is the dragon. By the way, this is every New Yorker's favorite building. That building that that dragon is next to, that's not the one that King Kong was hanging off of. That's not the Empire State Building. Not the most famous building in New York. This is the Chrysler Building, which has beautiful arches, and most New Yorkers love this building more than any other building in New York. So I'm glad they picked this one for the poster. And what's hanging around there is a dragon, a typical dragon as we would think of it, a European dragon. Believe it or not, there's two kinds, there's European and Asian. And the European dragon is essentially a really big lizard with wings. So this started out looking like this. This is one of, one of the earliest drawings, it's been colorized for us, but it's one of the earliest drawings of one of these mythical dragons. And it looks like a hodgepodge of a whole bunch of things thrown together. It's got the head of some kind of beast, it's hard to tell what it is, maybe it's a lion, it looks a little bit like it has a lion's mane, it's breathing fire though. It's got the neck of some kind of lizard-like animal with the fins on the back, almost like a fish. It's got the tail of a serpent, it's got the wings of a bat, and it's got the legs of a lion, all thrown together. And that was one mythology, is what this, this animal is, it was just a mixture of everything. But in fact, most of the mythologies of dragons look something like this. And these are all pictures, uh, except for the one in the very center top. These are pictures of St. George fighting the dragon. The one at the very center top, this one up here, is what people thought dragons look like. So it had a head, it had a long neck, it had at least two legs, sometimes no legs, occasionally four legs, but usually no legs, and a very long tail. And if you look at the dragons, it will be old medieval pictures, they are basically serpents. This one's a little hard to see, it's red, but it, there's the head of it being stabbed. It's a serpent. This one down here, this is a serpent, and this one also is a kind of serpent. The only one that starts to look a little bit like we think of dragons, like something out of you know, Harry Potter maybe, or out of the Lord of the Rings, or The Hobbit, is something like this, okay? So this is actually a more lizard-like animal. Its, its head is over here, and it's got, it's got legs, and there's some claws over here, and over here, here's its tail. So that came a little bit later, but it started out really with people thinking that these were really large snakes. So could that be real? Where would they get that from? Well, we saw the, the rattlesnake skin. That was a pretty large snake. 
but by world standards, it's not a big snake. Yes, I heard someone say anaconda. Very good. Yes, anaconda is right. That is what's being shown on the top here. This is an anaconda. Look what it's taken down. A cow. That's an animal cow, a pregnant cow. So it's a really big cow. And this anaconda actually is filled by a cow. Not by suffocation, by the way. When they wrap their coils around the animal, what they do is they squeeze so hard that the heart stops beating. That's how they kill the animal. And once the heart stops beating, then they can swallow it because they won't struggle anymore. But you can see how big this snake is. Look at the, the width of this snake is bigger than my thigh. That is a really large animal. So this looks like that. That's about the size of what St. George was trying to kill. And why was a snake such a popular animal for dragons? Because it represented evil. And St. George killing the dragon was really a story to talk about a good triumphing over evil. Or actually, really religious good. Christianity triumphing over Satan, or the devil. And the snake was represented as the devil. Because, after all, in the Bible, who gives the apple to eat? The serpent. Yes. And so the serpent got a bad name right from the beginning. So in Christianity, the serpent represents evil. Now, we know today this the serpent doesn't represent evil. It's one of the many wonderful animals that live in the world. But you can see how people would be terrified of an apple that could take down a cow. I mean, that's about as big as it's going to get. That's, that's huge. But the other animal that also inspired the dragon was the Komodo dragon, named because of course it looks like a dragon. And you can see one here that's attacking a goat. So this is a pretty big lizard. Also about the size of the one in that uh, sculpture that St. George was fighting. So where then did the idea of wings come from? This probably came from looking at a particular lizard, which was this one over here, which is called the frilled dragon. And if you look at the early drawings, it's basically a serpent with some kind of crunchy looking, you know, fluttery, torn up looking wings. Not very, not very pretty looking wings, not like we imagine them. Because this was probably someone trying to draw this, the frill collapsed. So it looked like folded up wings on the back of the dragon. Because when it folds up its neck folds, it looks like folded up wings. But in fact, these are just extra skin on the neck which flares out. This is this lizard's version of a lion's mane. It's making itself look big and scary by putting that frill out. It's basically like opening up an umbrella, except the umbrella's all around the head. There's the mouth open. It's trying to look as scary as it can. The reality is this is a lizard about this big. <laughs> so you can step on it, okay? This is not a very scary dragon. But if you take the stories of a lizard like this and you combine it with the snake that we saw before and the Komodo dragon, you can see how the stories would take off and all of a sudden it's this giant beast, big and flying, with huge teeth, big mouth. Well, where did this gigantism come from for dragons? It's possible that it actually is very much grounded in truth. And the truth is fossil bones. Because what people found in the ground were bones from dinosaurs. But they didn't know what dinosaurs were. They didn't understand evolution. They didn't know that these were bones of an animal that had gone extinct. They thought these were evidence, real evidence, that dragons existed. Because when they put all the bones together, what they got was something that looked like this. Right? Can you imagine if you saw something that looked like this? So the fossil dinosaur bones were considered proof of this animal with the long neck and the long tail. Because after all, just add wings and essentially a brontosaurus or a sauropod becomes a dinosaur. Really? It looks just like that when you think about it. And then it doesn't only have a long neck and a long tail. What else does a dragon have? Long teeth. Sharp teeth and claws, okay? Let me show you a dinosaur claw. This is a replica of one, it's not a real one. But it's molded to look exactly like the real one. You look at a human hand, right? Here's a human hand. Okay? What do we have on the end? Fingernails, right? Let's put on a little document camera. Let's look at that close. Here's a human hand. Just the bones from the hand. If you found that in the ground, you'd go, okay, human, not terribly scary, right? Just looks like that, right? I mean, it's scary maybe it's dead, but. But you know, can't hurt you when he's dead, right? Because other people are way scarier. They can hurt you. Okay, so here's here's the human. Now imagine one of these nails sticking out, right? These nails are 
My nails are, they need to be clipped. But anyway, there they are. There's some nails. <laughs> Not very scary, right? You <laughs> found that. Okay? Yeah, I heard someone say, oh my God. Yes. Okay, so there we go. You see something like this, you're like, whoa, whatever that was, it was terrifyingly big. Because look at the nails on that. That's just one nail. Now you imagine you've got a whole set of them together. This is a terrifyingly large animal. And it didn't, oh, it didn't only have really sharp, big, long, heavy, scary claws. It also had big, heavy, sharp, scary teeth. Let's take a look at, let's look at this, okay? Here's an animal they were familiar with. They knew about snakes, okay? Here's a snake. One, one jaw is open so you can see the teeth on that snake. Right? Can you see that? Okay, see those sharp, scary looking teeth? Yeah, they're pretty scary. What would you think if you found a tooth that was this size? Right? You can probably barely see it. Okay, let's let's dial this out so you can see it. Okay, so you imagine, you're used to seeing teeth like this in a serpent, and then you come across something like this. What if you came across something like this? Now, this is a very small dinosaur, a small raptor. Okay? This is a dinosaur head. That's kind of looking a lot like the snake. You can see where the, the similarity of the dinosaurs and these snakes comes in. Because we're looking at something that's very similar. That's a small version. Let's go to the large version. This is a real snake skull. This is, this is real. This is a replica of a dinosaur. A very small one. But look at... Where's my, where's my picture not coming up? Hello. What, the, what do I need to do? I'm going to need to toggle back and forth. Okay, so I press that. Now I press this. It's going to go to my computer. But if I quit now and restart, see if that helps. Does that help? Doesn't help. I don't know why the connection's not coming through. It may be somebody with more technical savvy than me to come up here and help me. So the dinosaur head that I wanted to show you has huge teeth, okay? We're talking about teeth that are almost as long as this claw. I want you to imagine a tooth that's this size, okay? A tooth that's this size, hanging from the mouth, and the dinosaur whose head. Imagine it much, much, much bigger than this, okay? We want to make it huge, like we fill this whole table plus. If you found that as you were digging around the ground, you could say for sure dragons exist because now we've got these enormous teeth, way bigger than this little thing that uh, St. George was trying to kill. This is not one of them, Okay, well, we're going to keep on talking while that happens. So, in addition to the big teeth, we'll come back to that, there were big spines on the backs of dinosaurs. So on the backs of dinosaurs, imagine there were big spines sticking out of their back. If you look at a human spine, it's a human spine. We have kind of wiggly spine when it comes to dinosaur spines, right? And we have these projections sticking out of the back of our spine. Can you see them here? There's three of them right here. They're pretty small, they're pretty flat, they're pretty close to the, the bodies of the spine. Now imagine if they were really tall, sticking up. Then you would think whatever this animal was, it had big spines on its back. And you often see dinosaurs with these really big spinous processes on the bones. And they interpret those to be giant spines on the back of a dinosaur. And when you look at a dragon, you think the same thing. It's basically a giant dinosaur, right? So, you have drawings of them with big, big spines. It doesn't want to do that. Should we take out this? Okay. You 
keep working on that, and I'll keep going on to other interesting things about dinosaurs. So dinosaurs also had really big, heavy bones. So when you see the large bones of the dinosaur, you start to think, okay, whatever this is, you build it up, it's huge. But well, where did the wing part come in? How many of you have heard from the pterodactyls? Right? It's the winged dinosaur. So the, oh, yes, we have something. It came up. I'm afraid to switch back and forth. You better stay close. <laughs> okay, so we'll get to wings in just a minute. I just want to show you these giant teeth. This is a T Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Each of these teeth here, about this long, okay, really big. And the head bigger than this table. And look at the claws down here. See the claws over here? These are enormous. Now let's go up to this one with the spines. Look at the spines on here. I can't point from here, so I'm going to use this little pointer that's in here. See these spines? They have spines on their backs, like Stegosaurus has them, or Spinosaurus has them. Look at the spines on the back of this one. Look at the spines on the back of this one. Look at the spines on this one. So clearly dinosaurs had spines, therefore dragons were reconstructed with spines. And then come the wings, the pterodactyl wings. So when you start adding in the wings, they didn't know which bones went to which animal. Sometimes they found things jumbled together. It was really hard because they didn't understand how to excavate into proper paleontology. So they mixed a lot of things up. And in some places they found pterodactyls and they were big dinosaurs, right? And some places they found Brontosaurus and it was a big dinosaur. Put the stories together and you end up with a Brontosaurus like animal with wings, which is what we normally think of as a big, tra giant dragon. Long tail, long neck, spines on the back, and wings. But what about the fire breathing part of the myth? Where did that come from? That one is a little bit harder to explain. But a lot of the stories came from understanding where they thought dragons lived. They thought dragons lived in caves at the tops of mountains. And surely at the tops of mountains, that's where lightning came from, because that's where the storms would gather around the mountaintops. And if there were lightning strikes, and that lightning spread to the town below, to the village, surely it was the work of the dragon that did that, because they didn't understand where this fire was coming from. And most of those villages were made of you know, buildings that had straw roofs and, and wooden sides, and therefore they burned very, very easily. So one little bit of fire in the whole town would explode in fire. So it was a devastating thing, and of course they would blame it on the evil who is the evil? Who is the embodiment of Satan? Who is the dragon? The really big serpent. But in addition, the fourth tongue is partly what gave rise to this. I feel a little off. So I want to see the snake up close. Watch what happens. I want you to watch this little video. Watch the head of the snake carefully. It's going to be very fast, but you're going to see a tongue flick out of the snake. And when it does, it's going to look like this. A little tongue. It's red. Maybe not as red as that. And it's forked. And the reason for the forked tongue is so that the snake can pick up odors in the air with its tongue. It's basically smelling the air with its tongue, or tasting the air. And it can tell which side of the forked tongue has the stronger odor, and it will turn toward the side with the stronger odor, so it knows where to go to try and catch its prey. So let's watch this little guy. Don't worry about the sound. This is a behind-the-scenes tape. You know, we were not on camera at the moment. Someone just filmed this with their, their video camera, and I thought, okay, they put their phone and sent it to me. So we were just practicing, see if we get the snake to stay still. And she did not want to stay still. <laughs> but see that tongue looking in and out? That tongue looked like a flame coming in and out of the snake's mouth, especially because it was red and it was forked. And so everyone assumed that this was a fire being breathed in and out, because people would make drawings or paintings of these snakes with the tongue flicking in and out. And when other people would see it, who've never seen the snake, they would assume it's fire flicking out of its mouth. And that's probably where the legend of the fire really came from. But what about Asian dragons? Now, Asian dragons are a little bit different from the European dragons because they're long, snake-like animals. And these long, snake-like animals were actually forces of good in the world. They were not forces of evil. They represented good things like bringing rain, and bringing fertility and bringing prosperity. This is what these dragons were all about. And they were able to fly even without wings. They moved through the air and up into the clouds. And they were a source of power, but they were good power, not bad power. So the Asians did not fear these animals. But why then did they draw them or imagine them as snakes with legs? They didn't care about the wings, they cared about the legs. Probably because, again, yeah, you've seen this, right? Remember Mushu? How many of you have seen Mulan? Okay, so Mushu is a very 
very typical Asian dragon. He has wings. He breathes the fire, but he does not have wings. And that's because if you look at boas and pythons, they actually do have legs. And the legs stick out as two little hooks. Can you see them here? There's one right over here, and there's one right over here. These hooks stick out in the males, and they're actually used for mating. They grab the female with these hooks. And inside the body, the little stretch is made up a And they have hands, so they can't really like hug them, right? So they use these little hooks. And these hooks, if you look at the rest of the hook inside the body, look, here's the hook, and here's actually a thigh bone. It's essentially this. This bone right here in a snake. That's what you're seeing inside a snake. So snakes really do have legs in some species. Why? Because they evolved from an ancestor that had legs. And then over time, their descendants got rid of the front legs because they didn't need them to crawl. And they reduced the back legs and just kept them what the little they needed for mating. But it's a signal that this is actually an animal related to lizards which do have legs, and that is what inspired the Chinese dragons to have legs. Okay, let's talk about another mythical animal. This is the griffin. Heard of a griffin? You may have heard of a hippogriff if you watched Harry Potter. And if you read Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass, you may remember this animal here, which is the griffin. So the griffin, or the hippogriff, is basically a combination of the evil-like animal and a four-legged back end. And that four-legged back end is either horse-like, which would be a hippogriff, or lion-like, which would be a griffin. Do not ask me why Gryffindor's animal is a lion. It should be a griffin. He only got the back end right. He need the front end in Hogwarts, okay? So Gryffindor should have had a griffin. But anyway, so they got the back part as the lion, but the front end looks kind of like an eagle's head, and they imagine it with wings. This legend is of an animal travelers would speak about that came from foreign lands, like areas like Mongolia, an area between China and Russia. And they spoke of this animal as having all these characteristics, plus it was guarding gold in the desert. And we know dragons guarded gold. Well, these actually guarded gold, too. So what was this legend all about? I saw with a really big, eagle white face. Look at the face of this animal. It's got an eagle beak. But the rest of it looks like it's more like a dinosaur to us, but we know what dinosaurs. They didn't know what dinosaurs were. So they saw, well, it's got four legs, and the front legs have bigger claws, and the back legs have smaller claws. So the front legs must be the talons of the eagle, and the back legs must be like a lion's claws. But they weren't quite sure what to do about this tail. So they added a little pilchy, pushy part of the tail over right here. They weren't quite sure what to do with this bone either. So Let's, let's start with the front end. So the front end has an eagle's beak. <coughs> and you can see how this looks very much like an eagle beak. So if you saw this and you didn't understand evolution, you would think this was a really big eagle. They said this part was an eagle, very, very fragile. Now, and here's one where they broke the middle hairs on the griffin. Because what they were seeing were broken pieces of this side. And look how devilish this looks. That's a pretty scary looking animal. It's got these yellow horns over here, and a big sharp beak in the front. The other animal that could have inspired this was traders coming back across the Mediterranean with prizes that they found called sea turtles. This is the skull of a sea turtle. Look at that. Does it look like it has an eagle beak? Yeah, it does. Well, someone said no, so not to you, but to everyone else it does. That's okay. So let's put that, I'm afraid to move this thing, but I'm going to try. Let's see if this will, let me show you the eagle beak. Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, so here's the eagle beak. Close it, and you can open it. Turn it up like this. Let's see a little bit more of that sharpness. But this could have also given rise to the legend of this parrot-like beak in the front, a really big head, because these animals were found at the seashore at the edges, and they were brought across the Mediterranean by traders. And so some people thought this was a griffin because of that eagle-like beak. 
It's very different from something like this. You know what this is? Really, really big alligator, right? You open up its mouth. Look at these teeth. Right? These are huge. Now we're looking at something that's much more dragon-like. Right? See these teeth? Now if you think these are big, right? What size of that tooth compared to my finger? Okay, the bigger than this. Really scary, scary dragons. Okay. Let's see if it will act here. Yes. Okay. So we've got the eagle beak, we've got the broken frill which look like ears. We've got four legs with claws in the front. Did they look like that? It's got a long tail with a swelling in the middle. This is the swelling that's right over here. And there it is over here. And then they came to the shoulder blade, but they didn't know what to do about the shoulder blade. Because this shoulder blade is so weird looking. Look at it. It's very, very, very long. They thought this looked kind of like the bone you see inside a chicken that's against the chicken carcass that supports the wing. And so they thought this was a wing. So they reconstructed griffins with ears, with wings, with a lion's tail, with a lion's hind legs, and eagle-like front legs, and an eagle beak, because of all these things that they found. Let's go to another animal, the Loch Ness Monster. Another dinosaur. Dinosaurs figure big in mythology. People didn't understand evolution. So, lots of people think that the Loch Ness Monster was this. This is a plesiosaur. This is a photo that was taken of the Loch Ness Monster, a famous photo called the Surgeon's Photo. He later admitted it was a hoax. <coughs> Lots of people suspected it all along based on the size of the waves around that head. The waves that would be on the lake couldn't be that big. It's a lake, it's not the ocean. And therefore, that made this animal look like it was only about this big. So whatever that was, could have been a swan, maybe. Highly unlikely it was an elephant, not mess. Most likely it was a toy dinosaur. So back to our Brachiosaurus again. Brontosaurus. We didn't get far from the dragons, so. And here it is again. But it's almost the same. Look, it's got the same head and a little bit of back showing. It was probably a toy very much like this. But they put in the water, silhouetted it, and therefore you couldn't tell that it was a plastic toy because it was in silhouette with the light behind it. Yet people still insist there is a plesiosaur in Loch Ness. So this is the skull of a plesiosaur. This is what it looks like. And they would show evidence of things like this and say, see, here it is. This is a plesiosaur. This is actually the head of a pike. It is a fish. It is not that big, it's about this big. And its head is typical fish bone. It is not a plesiosaur, it's not dinosaur bone. It falls apart into lots of little, little pieces when you take the flesh off the top, and the teeth are all wrong. But it had the right shape, didn't it? Then here's another thing that watched it. Look at this animal over here. Look at the head on that. Here's the neck. Here's a big flipper. Here's the backbone. And people said, this. Clearly, is a plesiosaur, but in fact, it's just a basking shark. So, basking sharks, if they rot, they lose the lower jaw and the gills. That all falls off the shark, and what's left is this little tiny shark head. Because sharks have bitty little tiny brains, and then the rest of the spine, and then the big flippers of the basking shark down here. And people claim that that was a plesiosaur because it, it looked to them like a plesiosaur. Of course, a basking shark would never be in Loch Ness, so it didn't make any sense. So we're looking for something that looks more plesiosaurus, and the idea is that it lifts its head up like a swan. So could a plesiosaur really do that? Probably not. Because if you look at the spine of a plesiosaur, here's a plesiosaur spine, here's the animation version, right? If you look at the spine and you look close up, you see these points that stick up? They're already pretty close together. They're already pretty close together. Look at these guys, they're side by side. So we can lift it up only to the point where those spines are next to each other. It can't go anymore. Which means if you lift the head just straight, even if it was a plesiosaur, that photo had to be fake. Because it could never achieve that swan neck pose. Well, what if it were a sea serpent? That 
several of his other favorite Loch Ness Monster is a sea serpent. Well, sea serpents have been sighted, but they turn out to be very long, skinny animals, such as an oarfish. This is an oarfish. It's a very long fish. It's an eel-like fish. It's very, very pretty. It's got lots of colors on the side when it's alive. And it's a deep sea fish. So you're very unlikely to see it unless it washes up on shore after a tsunami or something like that. This is the carcass of a small whale that is decomposed. So most of the whale-like features are gone. All you've got is a tail, but you can't see the flippers, fins, and stuff on it because that's all fired up. So you've got a pointy long tail, no hind legs, four legs that look like flippers, of course, and then a head over here. So people thought, well, it's got a long neck and a long tail and flippers. It must be a plesiosaur. No. But if you look at many whales swimming together, sometimes you can get the idea that all of these humping backs over here are actually the many humps of a sea serpent. Especially if the lead one jumps out of the water, right? That's really one like the head of a sea serpent. So people at sea had seen whales jumping, and they'd seen whales barking and swimming in groups and thought, you know, they were out at sea, they thought it was a sea serpent. And people on the land looking at them from far away would have known sea serpents existed because they didn't understand what whales were. And therefore, when they saw something in the lake that looked like that, they assumed it was the same. Never mind the fact that this was a saltwater set of animals. They, they would never live in the lake. However, they assumed it was the same because it had the same pattern. Well, here's something that it could have been because sturgeon live in the rivers near Loch Ness. And if a sturgeon swam into the lake, it sure would look like a fossil that was alive still. Kind of like a coelacanth. You know, an old-fashioned fish that we thought was extinct, but it turned out to still be alive. Well, sturgeons look a lot like that. They had giant scales on them that looked like armor plating, so they looked very reptilian. Or maybe they saw a freshwater eel or a lamprey. These are all serpentine-like animals, but they're too small to explain the Loch Ness Monster. And they assumed something underneath made that. You know, and if the weight lifts up a little bit, you might imagine that there was some animal there. Maybe it was some guy with a stick. This one here. <laughs> Maybe it was a snake swimming in the water. <coughs> Except that this isn't actually a snake. This is a piece of tree branch that happens to have a couple of wiggles in it. Here's another tree branch that broke over here. It kind of looks like a dinosaur head. Here's another log with a twig hanging off of it. All of these were pieces of wood that looked like serpents from far away. So a lot of the sightings could have just been logs floating in the river or floating in the lake. Or they're outright frogs. This was actually a photoshopped frog. It's made to look like a baby plesiosaur, but in fact it was a rubber model someone made. But this really is a real photograph and really looks like a Loch Ness monster and really was taken in Loch Ness. Here's the head. Here's one arc on the back. Here's another arc. Can we say for sure that this is Loch Ness Monster if we can vouch that this was not a tampered with photograph? And I can vouch this was not a tampered with photograph. Well, if you look at it more carefully, really carefully, this is a separate animal from this one. And this is a separate animal from this one. And this one's head is a seal. There's seal heads. There's some more seal heads. Here's a seal with some back showing. Here's a seal looking at you. Here's a back. Here's another back with a little bit of a flipper in it to give you a little spine. See that? These are what you're seeing here. This is a seal back. This is a seal that's arcing. There's the two flippers from the back. This is a seal's head. So if you see a group of seals swimming along, you can imagine that that might look like a Loch Ness Monster. And that might explain our Loch Ness Monster. Speaking of seals, let's go to another underwater animal, mermaids. Oh, lots of people like mermaids, right? So European sailors told of these marine animals that had the head and upper body of a woman and the tail of a fish. And even in the Nuremberg Bible, you can see mermaids. There's a mermaid, there's a merman, this is a mer dog. What's a mer dog? A sea lion is a mer dog. You ever look at a sea lion? It's basically a mermaid dog. Okay, so they didn't need to be rescued because they could clearly swim in the water. Well, we can understand the mer dog. That's the easy one. That's seals and sea lions. But this is what probably inspired the mermaid. Something like a mammoth 
Sea, the Laduga. These are called sea calves. Now, what's interesting about them is they have a fish like tail. But their head is different, and they breathe air because they are mammals. And they actually have chest breasts. They nurse their babies. Here's one nursing its baby, right here at its breast, which is over here at the chest. Very few animals have breasts in the chest, right? Where do cows have their mother? In the back, right? So most animals nurse their babies on the back end. The only animals with breasts on the chest are humans, another primates, elephants, and the sea cows. And that's it. So when the sailors saw this, they thought, well, it must be a woman, because it sure doesn't look like an elephant. So it must be human. They didn't know what sea cows Very short snout. Okay, and here's, here's the seal. And what might have inspired this legend is the seal heads popping out of the water looking a lot like women with very big, beautiful eyes. Because after all, they have very round heads and very big eyes. Yes, yeah, so you have to be seeing that distance, okay, without the nostrils. And what they were mistaking was the fact that they had still round. Because most animals don't have these round heads. Look at a human skull. Here's a human skull. It's very round. Right? It's just like a ball. It's very round. <laughs> Seals have very round heads too. This one is a particularly elongated one. This is a crab nuker seal. And this seal, well, this might actually be a leopard seal. This seal has a round head in the back. It's not the roundest of all seals. It's big enough here, I don't need to show you on the document count. But if you imagine that very round head of harbor seals, which they were more likely to see, because those seals live in the Arctic. But if you look at a round headed Animal, something with a very round head. You would imagine that that was very human like. Because most animals have very long heads. And that is probably where this mythology came from. But it could have also come from pathologies that people knew about. They mixed together, and it's called mermaid syndrome. Because here you have huge legs, and this looks like the tail of a mermaid, so does this. Because where the toes are, fused together, has that appearance of a mermaid. That's Okay, Cyclops. Let's talk about Cyclops now. So the Cyclops is a giant human with one eye. This is described in a story, a Greek story, where Polyphemus was described as living on the island of Sicily. Okay, and he was he was a dangerous Cyclops. He was huge. And what did they use as evidence of him being huge? Bones that they found that were a lot bigger than human bones. Here's a human thigh bone. Okay? Imagine it. It's like this big, okay? You see the guy carrying that bone? It's a lot bigger than this one I'm holding here. So they found what looked like human bones that were enormous. They found lots of back bones and rib bones that were enormous. And they thought these had to be giant. This is a human thigh bone. This was what they were finding. They didn't understand what they were finding. What it looked like they were finding were probably elephant bones. <coughs> from a, a younger, a smaller species of elephant called a dwarf elephant or a forest elephant. Not as big as the African or Asian elephants imagine today. But they didn't understand how to put the skeleton together. So you can see very similar bones here. Here's the thigh bones. Here's the arm bones. And they look very similar to ours. They're just a lot bigger. Add to that, skulls that they found with enormous teeth. Okay, so you see the teeth on that human skull. Okay. Imagine you saw this tooth. This is a fossil tooth from a mammoth. This is one tooth. One tooth. If you imagine that you saw that, you would think whatever this was was surely going to eat your bones and grind it to dust, which is what you imagine giants do. And so the story of a cyclops eating people and grinding their bones came from finding teeth like this. These are teeth of an animal that is a relative of the modern elephant. This is from a mammoth. But what they were finding probably weren't mammoths. They were a little bit small, but look at this. This jaw almost looks like a human jaw. It's the angle, just like in a human, with these big teeth. And then they saw the front of the skull. Look at the front of the skull. It's got tusks, so they imagined that this giant had tusks. And look at this giant eye socket. Clearly, it didn't have two eye sockets like a human, 
Okay, here's a human with two eye sockets. I don't have an elephant skull here, so you have to look at the picture up there. Do you imagine there was one eye in the middle of that? Yeah, that is where the cyclops is coming from. But in reality, the elephant's eye is up on the side like that. So what was this hole that they were seeing that made them think it was a cyclops? It was actually where the trunk of the elephant went up. This is what a dwarf or forest elephant looks like. And here is ghosting on a picture of an elephant on top of that. See? If I go, if I go back, keep track of this. This is where the eye is. This is where the nose is. Okay, we'll leave the pointer here so you can see that's where the eye is. There it is. The eye is on the side. What you are seeing up here is the entrance of the two nostrils to go into the skull. It's the nose hole that they thought was an eye socket, and that's what made them think they were seeing a cyclops. But where did they get the inspiration of a cyclops to begin with? Cyclops, or cyclopia, actually really happens. It happens in people. I don't have any pictures of people to show you here, but I am showing you some animals with a cyclops eye. Here's a cat, a baby cow with two eyes in one socket. This is a newborn taxidermy goat with one eye. Here's a real sheep with one eye socket and two eyes. This is a real goat with one eye. This is a real kitten. It's a kitten with one eye. Yes, it really can happen. And it happens to people too. So they knew about this. But they just thought it was a lot bigger when they saw the elephant skulls. Okay, let's talk about one of your favorite animals, the longhorn, right? This is a Texas longhorn riding the New York subway. What's the nearest subway looks like? So the legend of the Minotaur. Minotaur was the offspring of a queen that had an affair with a bull. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. And here's the baby. Here's the baby. Here's the bull head. Here's the human baby. The bull head, human baby. Right? That's what happened. So they locked this animal into the labyrinth, a maze. Here's a coin showing what the labyrinth looked like. Big maze. It was designed by Daedalus. And it was fed tributes of young people. It supposedly ate these young people. So it was a terrifying animal. So this guy Theseus decides he's going to kill the Minotaur because he didn't want any more young people to die. So these are pictures de depicting him grabbing the bull by the nose. And, and here's a sword, here's another picture where he's grabbing it by the head. In this case, the animal has one horn on the top of its head and a very short face. In this case, it has two horns and looks more like a bull. We don't really know what the Minotaur looked like. But we do know that they had giant cattle in that area. And they were terrified of these giant cattle called aurochs. So these cattle, this is what they look like compared to modern cattle. So, so here is, here's the ancient auroch over here. Here's the, the male. This is the female. This is a modern bull and a modern cat. So you see they're almost twice the size of our modern cat. So they were terrifyingly big. Here's just the, the, the top of the skull and the horns over here. And you can see how really large those horns are. But horns were actually not a weird thing to the people. Because they had seen other things with horns. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the, uh, the, the comic character Hellboy. Here's Hellboy right here. So this is a modern creation of that mythology. Maybe you've seen this, the pictures of the sculpture of uh, Moses, Michelangelo's sculpture of Moses. He's depicting the horns coming out of his head. Jews did not really have horns coming out of their heads. What they saw was they made horns because they translated the Hebrew law. It was translation of light coming out of the head. And they said horns of light meaning these giant rays of light. So they actually physically made horns. But where did that inspiration come from? It came from real people who really did have horns. So real, real people grew horns. And you can see, look at all of these different kinds of horns. These are real people. This, this one has to have a horn coming out of an area where it got burned on the side of the chest. So it doesn't really happen on the head. But real people had real horns. If these people existed in the days of the Minotaur, they would have been locked away in the laboratory. Today, if you don't have surgery, they get removed. How about the unicorn? Speaking of horns, everyone loves the unicorn, right? But you know, you get a picture like this. This is not a horse. This is a horn and a beard. So the unicorn, the legend of the unicorn is that its horn was magical. And if it dipped it into water, it could take water that you put in drink, 
It was poisoned and turned it into drinkable water. So the horn had magic. But if the horn couldn't accomplish its magic, it had to fall off the unicorn. And so where would you find unicorn horns? In the ocean. In the ocean water. Well, some people saw them in Africa. They said, well, there's the unicorn. Look, it's got one horn. Marco Polo described it as scarcely small as an elephant. They have feet like an elephant. It's a single black horn in the middle of the forehead. The head like a wild boar. They spend their time by preference mowing in mud and slime. They are very ugly brutes to look at. They are not at all as we describe them as unicorns. Well, that could be the unicorn. It could be this animal, which is a white bow like animal. It actually has two horns, and in terms of profile, looks like one horn. Okay? This is an oryx. This is an African animal. And may have been the source of the legend of the unicorn. But this is the animal that was probably used as a group of unicorns. It's called a narwhal. And narwhals have a tooth, not a horn, not a tuck, not, not a horn, not an antler, a tooth. This is what a narwhal tooth looks like. No way! Coming out of its mouth, like that. Okay? Not out of its forehead. This is a replica of a narwhal tooth. When people saw this, where did they get it? At the edge of the ocean, because unicorns clearly lost their power in the ocean. Because there's no way they could revert the whole ocean into drinkable water, so they were destined to lose their horn. Traders would bring these back from across the ocean from Greenland and say, I have proof of the unicorn. Here it is, the horn. And people would buy this. Who would buy it? Kings and queens. Queen Elizabeth paid for a unicorn horn as much as it would cost to buy a whole castle. She spent that on a unicorn because it was sound proof that unicorn horns existed. Therefore, unicorns existed. And people really wanted to believe in unicorns. Okay, I think it's about last two hours. We're going to talk about werewolves very quickly. Werewolves, that legend may have come from dog headed humans. There are lots of pictures of humans and dog heads. No one really understands more than just being able. They were called cytosemoly. But it could have come from people that were warriors that really channeled the spirit of the wolf and wore wolf clothing. So it, it could have been Viking berserkers. It could have been people who modified their faces to make them look like they had more of a snout sticking out front, like a muzzle, or had horns or teeth. But maybe it was a couple of baboons. Because baboons, if you look at a baboon's head, here's a baboon's head. Okay? A baboon, back of the head, looks like a human, it's round. The eye sockets look like a human. But if you look at the teeth on a baboon, the front end of the bedroom looks a lot like you're looking at a wolf. See those long teeth? Let's compare that to a wolf and a bear. To both. So they could have been seeing bears, because bears can stand up on two legs and walk on two legs for quite a long time. So they might have thought that these dog-headed people were actually people, when in fact they might have been bears, like this. See the, the teeth in the front? This is a bear. And let's compare that to a wolf. Here's a wolf. Very similar. See, this, this part here looks like a wolf. This part doesn't look like a human. This part looks like a human. So they thought these baboons were part human, part wolf. Back to our slides. Well, I'm hoping it warms up. So, the next picture that comes up here shows I shine. You ever shine a flashlight in the dog at night? You see one of the lights, it shines back at you, right? Right? Same thing with cats. The eyes look like they're glowing. And so, when the eyes are glowing, what you're seeing is the shine on the back of the eye that reflects light for an animal that hunts at night. This is an important feature because it actually can reflect that light back, and so it looks like the eyes are glowing. So people thought that wearables were animals with eyes that glow. If you take a flash picture of a human, 
what you get is red eye instead. And so the red eye is simply the back of your eye glowing in the flash because your eyes are dilated. If you look at the back of a human eye, it's just got blood vessels. But if you look at the back of a wolf's eye, there's a reflective layer back there that reflects the light back. And when it reflects the light back, it makes it look like it's glowing. So when people saw that, they thought that was something magical about this animal. And therefore, maybe werewolves were humans that had a little magic in the back of their eye because it was like flashing light. Oh, and we start again. I'm not going to go again. Okay. So, so think about that for a minute. You've got this animal with this really beautiful uh, set of teeth. They're dangerous, but it's thought to be part human. Where did that come from? It might have come from some human pathologies mixed in with what wolves look like. So there are some human pathologies where people have to touch hair. Have anyone, has anyone seen the movie Great Show? Okay, do you remember the dog here, the slow eye? Okay, so here's the eye of the eye Okay, here's, here's somebody who's rabies, a rabid animal, so somebody got bit by a dog, they might, they might get rabies and they might act crazy, and that was thought to be something scary, and maybe they were turning into a girl, and the legend to get bit by one of Here's the dog face man, or the dog boy, okay? This is a real human disease where there's too much hair growth. And so while these are all posters from the service, this is actually a photograph of a person. You see how close it looks like a person. He really has a lot of extra hair. So there is a disease where that happens. There's also a disease where people are sensitive to the sun, so they basically come out only at night. And what would you go out when the moon is full, when you can see what you're doing? So all of these behaviors led to people thinking they were wearable. Let's talk a minute about vampires. And the legend of vampires, the part we care about is not the bad. It's the blood-sucking part. Not the fact that they can turn into bats, but the blood-sucking part. But that's associated with bats. And so if you look carefully, here's a bat that's drinking blood. It's not drinking it out of these teeth. It's not. It's using those teeth instead. Here's a vampire bat, an actual vampire bat skull. Uses these teeth over here to cut the hair and skin, and it uses these teeth, the ones in the front, to make a puncture into a blood vessel, and then it simply limps the blood out from the hole. It doesn't have hollow teeth. What other has hollow teeth? The rattlesnake, because the venom is in those hollow teeth. And here is a local animal that you guys know about. Thank you. 